In my last video I was talking about fireworks and how they could potentially be radioactive due to a mineral called barite, where uh, they get the barium from to make the green color in fireworks. So let's check out this curious mineral. This is what the stuff looks like, but what actually makes it radioactive? Barite is barium sulfate, so a barium atom with a charge of plus two and a sulfate molecule with a charge of minus two, so they just get together for some electron sharing fun. Now, if we have a quick look at the periodic table, you can see that in the second group, in the alkaline earth metals, there's barium, but there's also radium. So radium will do the same. It will, uh, it will produce an ion with a charge of plus two, and uh, pretty much it'll like to undergo the same bonds as barium. And that's just what happens in the case of radio barite. The radium gets in there and forms a bond with the sulfate, so it becomes radium sulfate. So, let's check out these beautiful honey-colored crystals of barite with the pancake detector. And you can see it's so radioactive that it even maxes out the initial scale, so I have to switch it to times 10. That's about 2000 counts per minute from this. Now let's check out another piece of barite. You can see this piece is so hot, it even almost maxes out the times 10 scale, which I'm already on as you can see. Now if I flip it around, we're hardly picking up any radiation, so that means it's probably just a crystal that was radioactive here and not the matrix it's sitting on. Because it might actually be some type of granite containing uranium ore as well. Here's an example of that. This is a pitch blender uranium ore contained in granite host rock, also some pyrite and, well, other minerals in there. And you can see and hear that it's quite uniformly radioactive, but uh, the majority of pitch blender is in one spot, as we can hear now. So in comparison, the barite is not too terribly radioactive, but you can measure it with a gamma scout, for example, still. But well, to put it into perspective, comparing to pitch blender, of course, um, it's still a minor dose of radiation. Anyway, back to our barite. Uh, radium has a half-life of 1,600 years, so where the hell does that come from? It should be long decayed, right? Because this planet is 4.5 billion years old. So um, to investigate that, let's start with the pitch blender, which is mainly uranium-238. And well, uranium-238's half-life just happens to be 4.5 billion years. It does an alpha decay into thorium-234, which again does a beta decay and a gamma emission of 63 keV and 93 keV. But uh, these are not too good for detection in our gamma spectrometer, as they are in a mass of low energy stuff, X-rays, all kinds of different gamma energies, so not very useful. Now this isotope, protactinium-234, has a nice line at 1000 keV, with an emission probability of 0.8%, so that will actually indirectly allow us to see that there's some uranium in there, and we're dealing with uranium ore. Well, and then there's another uranium isotope down the decay chain, another thorium isotope, and finally, we're ending up with radium-226. So that's where it comes from. Uranium is the mother of the radium in our barite. So radium is a decay product of uranium-238 that gets flushed out with water and diluted other substances, acids, that flush it out, and then it ends up in the barite, replacing the barium, with a radioactive radium atom. Of course, a simple Geiger counter can't distinguish the elements that are present in this, so we have to use a gamma spectrometer. And we already know protectinium 234 provides us with a nice 1000 keV line that will pretty much uh, pro prove the existence of uranium 238. Now let's see what kind of useful peaks will be present after radium. Radon? No, that's a pure alpha emitter, same as polonium, that's why they could use it to poison Litvinenko. Anyway, but LED-214 provides us with very nice gamma energies, very high emission probabilities. And well, now I notice that if the mass number does not change, it cannot be an alpha decay, so that's a beta decay, my mistake, sorry. Anyway, bismuth-214 also provides us with very nice gamma energies, very high emission probabilities as well. But of course, if those are present, uranium could still also be present on the very top of the decay chain. So we have to look at the ratio from this 1000 keV peak from uh, protactinium versus the bismuth and lead peaks we can see in there. 
So if the 1000 keV peak is not present, then only uh, everything from radium on is present, otherwise uranium is also contained. Well, in just in case you're wondering what uranium will finally become, here's the rest of the decay chain, even though not important for our experiment. And you can see in the end, uranium will become stable lead, the very material that we use to shield radiation. Well now, let's feed the spectrometer with some nice barite crystals and see what's really in there. This is the spectrum of the most radioactive barite, and you can see the bismuth lines as well as the lead to uh, 214 lines bismuth and lead 214, which was expected. But you can also see a line there at 1000 keV, and that belongs to uranium. For comparison, here's the pitch blender, and you can see uh, that there's this line as well. So it's it's not pure. It seems to be less, but not pure. Let's look at that again in logarithmic scale. So this is the barite. You can see it also has this 1000 keV peak that belongs to uranium, or more like to uh, protactinium-234, but proves the existence of uranium. And this is the pitch blender. You can see it has more in relation to the other peaks in regard to that 1000 keV peak, but that proves that this barite is not, not very pure, so that there's uranium along with the radium as well. For comparison, this is a pure radium source, and you can see it does not have this 1000 kV line at all, if it's chemically really well separated. But well, this is another spectrum of a piece of barite, one of the less radioactive ones, and you can see it uh, still has a little touch of that 1000 kV peak, but it's much less in relation uh, to the other barite spectrum, so this is much more pure. This could actually be considered a radium mineral, barite, radio barite. Now, as another example, this is a thorium mineral. It contains very characteristic peaks that belong to actinium-228, which is not present in the uranium-238 decay chain, but belongs to the thorium decay chain. Again, this is pitch blender, and you can see it doesn't have those lines formally marked with those green bars. The gamma energies that belong to actinium-228. Now, what if we were to extract pure uranium? Well, this is what the spectrum would look like. You can see the 1000 keV peak is quite big in relation to all the others. All the low energy and medium energy stuff from uh, the radium decay chain onwards is missing. And we can even clearly make out uranium-235. Uranium-235 is only present with about 0.7% of the total contained uranium and natural uranium. That's why you can hardly see those low energy gamma lines in uh, natural uranium, which is in equilibrium with all the decay products, the daughters like radium and uh, the lead 214, the bismuth 214. Uh, but if you separate that, if you have pretty much pure uranium without the rest of the decay chain, you can easily see those nice low energy gamma lines that specifically belong to uranium 235. Anyway. Last but not least, let's measure this uh, container with barium sulfate, which can be used as a base material for making those nice green fireworks. Will that be radioactive? Will that be contaminated? Let's see. And yes, well, it seems like the cheap stuff I bought contains bismuth and lead 214, which again proves the existence of radium, pretty much. So um, yeah, my stuff is contaminated, so it was probably made partly from bar radio barite. But Barium sulfate is also used as a contrast agent. You swallow it, actually, to uh, give contrast to your stomach lining, for example, so it's visible on x-rays. Um, so it's dangerous to do this procedure? No, don't worry, it's not, because it is possible to chemically separate the barium sulfate from the radium sulfate. It's just a very thorough and expensive process if you have the radium in there. But there's also uh, barium minerals, some barite minerals, that do not contain radium in a great extent. So don't worry about this, the procedure itself is not harmful if done with licensed material for use in people. This is a spectrum of uh, laboratory-grade barium hydroxide, and you can see it's pretty much equal to background radiation, so not contaminated, not like my barium sulfate. And while the barium sulfate that I have it's not really suitable for medical examinations for ingestion. Uh, you know, it's one kilogram of that. It's, a, it's an entire bucket full of that. Remember how I tried to measure a rocket or even a few rockets on a detector? I could not measure anything because uh, a rocket just doesn't contain hundreds of grams of that barium sulfate or barium itself. So it doesn't contain that much radium either.
as I said, I could not measure anything. So, um, well, check out the other video if you still want to put it into perspective to the, the other radioactive stuff that you're inhaling. And as for medical exams, don't worry about it really, because you saw if you have a, a large enough quantity of the barium sulfate, you can easily check that for radium contamination. And the stuff I have, well, you could do things like putting it on your hands and then x-raying your hands to see uh, every, every little structure. Usually in x-rays you can just see the bones basically, but if you put barium sulfate, this very dense material, on your hands, then you can nicely see out every wrinkle, the fingernails and everything, but well, you probably shouldn't do that, but it looks nice anyway, right? Really does. Thanks for watching and uh, please don't randomly go x-raying yourself now because x-ray tubes actually can give off a lethal dose of radiation in a very short amount of time. So uh, keep that in mind and stay safe.